of whether this is a giant step for mankind to have the crime of aggression jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court finally activated really has to be answered in terms of what's really going on in the world today. It is certainly a momentous step that finally now, 71 years after Nuremberg, the International Criminal Court can finally try world leaders for committing illegal acts which constitute the crime of aggression. In theory, if a national leader committed the crime of aggression, they should be tried in their own home courts. That's an unlikely scenario because the people who are in power don't normally try themselves. That could only really arise if there were a regime change. Um, any prosecutor's office or any prosecutor has to weigh whether or not there's a likelihood of conviction in their court before deciding what cases to put on the dock. Whether the ICC will actually hear cases, I think, is actually less important than the fact that it could theoretically hear a case. In, in my view, the most important achievement is to have an internationally enshrined legal definition of a crime and act of aggression. So that is very big in, in and of itself. But without last night, Kampala would not have meant that. So this was a very, very big step. It's not the end of the, you know, it's not the end of the process um, at all. We have to continue working on this. So we're all part of a chapter in the history of this of this big project, and and yesterday I think was a very big step. But you know, in, in our view, what we did yesterday is in fact complementing the Charter of the United Nations because the Charter of the United Nations is built on the notion that the legal use of force is a violation of international law and is actually built on an extremely restrictive regime on when the use of force is legal. So that is the, this, this is the core of, of, of the UN, really. So to complement that with a regime that says, and those persons and those individuals who are political leaders, who are military leaders, who make the decisions that lead to the violation of this basic rule of international law, these people can be held criminally accountable for what they did, is an obvious necessary complement to that. So it took over 70 years to do that, so of course from our perspective it should have happened much earlier. But this is a very, very, very difficult issue both legally and politically. Prior to the meeting last night in New York, Britain and France not ratified the amendments on the crime of aggression. And the Guardian quoted me as having said, you would think that of all people, the nations which sat in judgment at Nuremberg would be embarrassed, if not ashamed, at the utter hypocrisy of failing to lead by example in ratifying the Kampala amendments on aggression. So they didn't ratify them, notwithstanding the fact that 35 countries have already ratified them, including over half the members of NATO. This is more than ironic. It's a disgrace. Whether they uh, were opposed to activation or not, I think is something that you should ask them. What they will tell you is that, you know, they were not opposed to activation. They just wanted to have activation with uh, a specific legal understanding reflected in the decision. And essentially, that is what they got. Um, what we said and what we will continue to say is that we you know, we respect that view because we had very long conversations uh, about the law adopted in Kampala. We continue to believe very strongly that our view is the right view. Many, many people um, hold the same view with us, um, but we respected their view. What we tried to achieve during the session is that they also re respect ours and that we tried to design a mechanism under which the view that they hold would be respected um, and honored also by the court in its exercise of jurisdiction, which we believe to be their goal. Um, but that did not work out, and that we found disappointing. A point that I'd like to make, and I have made this recently this week at the United Nations, I mentioned to you that I had actually put out some papers I had written, and the intention of these papers was to serve as a prod to countries which were seeming to stand in the way, potentially, of the activation decision, in particular countries like Britain and France, 
that had not ratified the Kampala Amendments. Now, what does ratification signal? Ratification signals a clear message to the world for the countries that ratify that we are not running from the law. Failure to ratify sends the exact opposite message. Now, in the countries that fail to ratify and who fail to bring the crime of aggression within their own national jurisdictions, at least so they can prosecute their own national leaders if they commit the crime, we have a terrible double standard, and that is that common, ordinary soldiers, men and service women, who are asked to sacrifice, to go out and sometimes give their lives for their country, they can be prosecuted for relatively smaller infractions, war crimes, I don't mean to minimize them, but smaller than the supreme international crime of aggression. And for the larger crimes, the top-tier politicians, the national leaders who send them to fight and die illegally are beyond the reach of the law. That hypocrisy, I believe, and that double standard needs to be ended. And the question of my own personal involvement in the Global Institute for the Prevention of Aggression, I would like to say first, Yes, it's been a very, very long process, and it's not been a 71-year process in trying to outlaw war. Many of us in the West would be familiar with the words of the prophet Isaiah 3,000 years ago, who said that we shall beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. How do you do that? You take the hammer of the law and you use it to beat it on the anvil of public opinion and you hope to make small changes. And the Global Institute for the Prevention of Aggression is nothing more and nothing less than a collective, cooperative effort of advocates, diplomats, scholars, academics, who have joined their thinking together to say, after the Kampala Review Conference, where these amendments were created and adopted, we should do something globally to ratify them, and we should try to put pressure through writing articles, through giving speeches, through ad advocacy. And that's what I've been involved in doing, and I've been writing on that, as you know, law review articles, been recently quoted in newspapers. I've been putting together sort of flyers at the United Nations saying that really these countries that sat in judgment at Nuremberg should be ashamed not to be taking the lead. And they haven't taken the lead. And uh, I think as you have already have some awareness that last night, at the United Nations and in the early hours of this morning, the British and the French led an effort to effectively, um, I think it's a fair statement to say, renegotiate in large measure what was, after very, very difficult negotiations and a significant compromise, agreed to by the entire Assembly of States parties, including Britain and France. So they've effectively come out with a different result. They held hostage, in my view, the entire Assembly of States parties, who were so eager to finally get something on the books to say today, we have an active jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, that they were willing to con make concessions, and that's what they did for the good of mankind. And there was a lot of built up uh, tension. This was, you know, not everything was, uh, was pretty what happened uh, this week as these things go. Um, but I think there was also a strong sense of, of relief and of collective satisfaction. So, you know, there was applause in the room. In the final hours, it was a bit of a roller coaster. It was a lot of up and down. It was very unclear whether we would be able to, uh, to find the consensus. And uh, finally, with the help from uh, many people, uh, we managed to, to get it done. And there was a back and forth in the room uh, for a while on the, on the last provision in, in the resolution, but then it was adopted. The debate started, you know, in a way nine months ago when the facilitation process and the activation uh, began. And, uh, of course, it was a very intense discussion during uh, the session of the, of, of the Assembly. Um, in, the, uh, in the final hours, we just tried to bridge, you know, the gap, the, the last remaining gaps. What happened in the room was that there was a, uh, a dispute on the inclusion of a provision and the independence of the judges of all things, that proved to be difficult. So I think for some people watching this from the outside that was probably rather puzzling, but it was also a bit of an indication how talks had been going all, all week, because uh, the side that you know, we belong to, that felt very strongly about uh, activating the Kampala amendments and felt very strongly about safeguarding the integrity of the Kampala amendments, had uh, reached out 
to those who had a different view on what happened in Kampala. The view that we have, and that many, many others have with us, is that in Kampala it was agreed that the jurisdictional regime of the court extends to the parties that have ratified the Rome Statute, provided that you know, there is also a ratification of the amendments of the Kampala Amendment of Crime of Aggression. Uh, some of the other countries, uh, led by the UK and France, held the view that this is a regime that only applies uh, between states that both have ratified the Kampala Amendment. So they view the jurisdictional regime to be uh, much more restricted and much more narrow um, than we do, and that's essentially that's the essence of the dispute that we had um, for the last months and up uh, until very late last night. So what happened in, in, the, in the decision itself is that we essentially made uh, very big concessions in order to get the regime activated. So for us, the decision was, do we want, what do we want more? Do we, are we very keen to activate tonight? Or are we very keen to continue making a very, very principled statement on the contents of the Kampala Amendments? And we chose the former. If you look at the provisions of the activation decision, there is a statement of a legal interpretation of the Kampala Amendments that we do not agree with. We, uh, we let that pass, we accepted that because of the reason I just described, because we, we thought activating is more important and also because we think the law given in the Kampala Amendments is applied by the judges. This is why it was so important for us that that decision also makes it very clear that the judges are independent and are free to and actually have to uh, freely interpret uh, the law that was given to them in Kampala. And this is, you know, the understanding with which we uh, joined that decision. So it was, you know, a decision that was at the, um, at the same time very difficult um, because it has a provision that essentially we disagree with. Um, but it was also at the end not that difficult and the more important thing was to get this regime activated which is such a big step because you no know, international court has had jurisdiction over this crime for 70 years. The effort to outlaw war, I think one could look back to the, frankly, 1700s when Emmerich de Battel wrote in a very, very well-regarded treatise called The Law of Nations that any sovereign who takes his nation into an unjust war, meaning a war not in self-defense, is guilty of a crime against the people he attacks, and he used the word crime, a crime against the people of his own nation. And he ended by saying, this is in 1758, finally, he is guilty of a crime against mankind in general, whose peace he disturbs. And of course, Robert Jackson at Nuremberg, in his opening statement, said the common sense of mankind demands that law shall not stop with the punishment of petty crimes by little people. It must also reach men who possess themselves of great power and make deliberate and concerted use of it to set in motion evils which leave no home in the world untouched. So that's what this effort is about. And Jackson was right. We see it today. We have a, an invasion in Iraq and we spawn ISIS. We have bombs that drop in the Middle East. We have counterattacks that occur in a stadium in Paris, on the streets and subways of New York, in Manchester and elsewhere around the world. No home is left untouched. It is an offense against the entirety of the human family. That's what we're talking about. In terms of the progress, I'd like to come back to a little story you may not know. Frank Kellogg, who was the American Secretary of State, actually received the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize in 1929 for the Kellogg-Briand Pact, although it was mentioned at Nuremberg as being the basis on which the world should have been put on notice that war is illegal. In fact, at the time when it was being adopted and debated in the U.S. Senate, on January 9th, 1929, John James Blaine, a Republican senator from Wisconsin, stood up on the floor of the Senate and he said, this treaty is a sham. He said, if it did what it purports to do, I would vote for it. He was the only man in the U.S. Senate to vote against it. And he saw that the British, in particular, had reserved for themselves 
the right to go to war anywhere in the world when in their sole discretion, without any judicial arbitration, they felt that their interests needed defending. The United States joined them in that reservation. They called them declarations, but they were reservations to the treaty. And Blaine stood up on the floor of the Senate and he said, the treaty weighted down by the reservations contains the fertile soil for all the wars of the future. Frank Kellogg, when he gave his acceptance speech, he said that some people say that war will be prevented when it is outlawed before a supranational court. But he said, I don't think that's the way law is going to be deterred. I think it will come from the court of public opinion. Now, that raises a very interesting question. Where does the court of public opinion come from? A quote from Nuremberg, not from Robert Jackson, but from Hermann Goering, which answers that question. And he was saying this in his jail cell in April 1946 to an American army psychologist, Gustav Gilbert. He said, naturally, the common people don't want war, neither in America, nor in England, nor in Russia, nor for that matter, in Germany. He said, that is understood. But after all, it's the leaders who make policy. And it is always a simple matter to drag the people along, whether it's a fascist state or a parliamentary democracy. Voice or no voice, he said. The people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them they're being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same way in any country. In recent history, for example, when Prime Minister Tony Blair uh, was deciding whether or not to join in the invasion of Iraq, he called for a legal opinion. And his legal advisor, the Attorney General, Lord Goldsmith, said to him in writing, the International Criminal Court does not have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. And we've all seen what happened in Iraq. And we've all seen the devastating consequences, the long-term consequences. It would have been perhaps a different result if Lord Goldsmith had said to him, the International Criminal Court does have jurisdiction and you could be theoretically charged before that court, even though it may be unlikely for world leaders to come before that court, they should know that they may. It's one of the things that I have been working on. It's, I've been working on many, many other things. This is probably fair to say that this is the project that in my career I've spent the most time on. I was uh, lo long years ago asked whether I wanted to chair a working group on this topic. And at the time I hesitated uh, to do so because it was not a very promising project. And everybody said, you know, this is going to result in nothing. Um, and I looked at it closer and I think everybody who looks at this topic closer and who likes legal issues can only be fascinated and attracted. I think it's certainly uh, telling that it is a project where a small state like us plays an important role. Um, because this is essentially about uh, protection of small states. Uh, you know, we are the ones who who rely on uh, on functioning international law. Of course, we're a state that does not have uh, does not have military forces, and you know, commitment to strengthening international law is one of the priorities of, of our foreign policy. If I say we, I mean uh, certainly ourselves, but you know, our like-minded, and we've had enormous support in this from all regions from the world. I mean, Switzerland has been a tremendous supporter, Palestine was a tremendous supporter, Slovenia was, Belgium was, um, Costa Rica was, Argentina, Mexico, Brazil, I mean, so many countries um, that helped us. And, you know, I think it also mobilized a lot of people. The American position with respect to the International Criminal Court has been, shall we say, very mixed. As you know, during the George Bush era, the American Service Members Protection Act was passed immediately after the court was created to essentially say that no American and no ally of any American could ever be dragged before this court. We would use all means necessary. And in The Hague, they refer to this as the Hague Invasion Act. It's a <clears throat> very misleading type of a bill uh, in concept. Because why? Because the International Criminal Court relies on the what they refer to as principle of complementarity, meaning it is not a court that drags Americans or British or anybody else before it. It says, hey, 
we think that there's some serious violation of international law on a large scale that this person may have been involved in, will you investigate? Will you prosecute? And uh, that's the way it works. You, they can't prosecute at this level of the International Criminal Court. They lack jurisdiction if a state is doing a valid, legitimate prosecution. So Americans don't have anything to fear from this court, theoretically, if the Americans mean what they say. We talk about liberty and justice for all. Some perceive that Americans have sort of now misconstrued that to mean liberty and just us for all. And that is the American position. We saw it just uh, this week. There was an American statement at the court uh, regarding the potential investigation by the court of American actions, and it reiterated America's commitment to law and the rule of law. So we've been ambivalent all along. Uh, it's a little known fact that the United States became the very first official member of the United Nations on August 8, 1945. Harry Truman put his signature to the bill. That very day is the very same day on which the Nuremberg Charter, called the London Agreement, was signed in London. UN Charter to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Yet that very day, before the sun had set on Washington or on London, the hum of engines from bombers which had left the island of Tinian were already on their way, not to obliterate Nagasaki, but to obliterate a town you've never heard of called Kokuro. When they got there, it was too cloudy to see the target, so they turned north. That's why the bomb was dropped on Nagasaki that day. There's always been this ambivalence. Harry Truman stood up on the floor of the General Assembly here in New York in 1946, and he said, I remind you, the 23 members of this body have already bound themselves to the law of the Nuremberg Charter and Judgment, which says that a leader who takes his nation into a war of aggression will be tried before the bar. He's called it a crime against humanity. He said that waging a war of aggression is a crime against humanity for which leaders will be brought before the bar of international justice. Harry Truman, and where have we come from there? Have we fulfilled that promise? We have a long way to go. What people tend to forget is that it's quite possible that we will not see a case before the ICC very soon. We are hoping to be able to get more states to join and you know many states are in the process of ratifying. The fact that the ICC has jurisdiction over the crime of aggression will not in and of itself end wars, of course. You know, uh, People don't start stop killing people because murder is illegal, so that's not that is not the only thing that you need, um, but it is it's an extremely important tool that helps us in this respect. I think my dad was so traumatized by what he saw firsthand during the war, liberating concentration camps, digging up the bodies of American flyers who had been shot down and murdered with his own hands, seeing the deprivation, seeing the colossal magnitude of man's depraved inhumanity to man has fueled him like a nuclear furnace. And you know it very well because you know him. This has been driving him his whole life. Now, he did something unusual when we were young. He showed us the first-hand photos of the concentration camps. And I used to wake up screaming with nightmares. And it uh, had quite a, an effect on me to know that this type of horrible thing happens in this world. And of course, when I was young, the Vietnam War was going on. And my dad has provided a beacon, I think, of reason and hope um, and inspiration to countless people around the world. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say millions. And as you know, his slogan, he reduces it to law, not war. And uh, you mentioned the Kellogg-Briand Pact a few minutes ago. There were people like Salman O. Levinson, a Chicago businessman, who in 1921 published a short treatise called The Outlawry of War. And so we're moving in this direction slowly hopefully with the communication that we have available today and the awareness of the potential for the destruction of all life on this planet, people will wake up before it's too late. Don and Ben have been our great, great uh, partners on this. We have had many, many partners, but truly without them it, it wouldn't have happened. Don was there last night. Don was incredibly supportive uh, throughout, uh, throughout the process and I really, really want to thank him also for his personal friendship. Ben, of course, is the 
a person who encapsulates the project in a way, because he was in Nuremberg, he was a tireless advocate for the inclusion of the crime of aggression in the in, in the Rome statute, and he has continued his advocacy since, and you know, I have really great personal admiration for him, so I really want to thank them both.